I got that turned off very good hi so Willie, do you want to take it from here sure so I just wanted to say a quick hello welcome to everyone um, thank you so much for joining us this is you know kind of an ad hoc 
gathering to remember George. Um, I had been waiting to see if someone in the family or Otis or any other friends might be organizing something. And although the uh, Washington DC theater community did put together a lovely 40 minute video of testimonials to George, um, no one had stepped up to create a space for people to gather and tell our George stories and sing our George songs. And um, I was feeling a need to do that. And so I was in touch with both Otis and George's niece, Faith, both of whom told me they were not planning to do anything and gave their blessings for us to go ahead and do something. So that's how this came about. And Betsy and I got to talking about it and have done a little bit of planning. So I just wanted to give a little quick brief overview of what we have in mind. So in a minute, Betsy will give us a little tech kind of introduction just for Zoom etiquette for this gathering. Um, Ken will fill in a little bit. Willie, Willie, give me one minute. I'm going to mute everyone and then Willie, you'll need to unmute. Just, yeah, that'll make it easier. And uh, Ken Giles will give us a little bit of an update on George's health challenges towards the end of his life for anyone who is not up to speed on that and would like to, to know. Um, then I'll give my little remembrance. Betsy will give hers and a little song. And then we'll open it up for anyone who would like to share a story or remembrance or a song. And we, you know, we do want to leave enough time for everyone who would like to do that. So we want to try to keep these pretty brief, you know, probably we're talking like four minutes or something like that. Um, at, at some point in the middle of that, we'll play a, a song that George sings. Um, then we'll continue on with those stories. We'll wrap it up with another song video of uh, Bright Morning Star. And then we're, we've left a little bit of time at the end for people to go into breakout rooms if you'd like to do that to kind of continue conversing in smaller you know gatherings where you can actually talk to people face to face so that's what we have in mind and um as long as there are no objections we'll go ahead and adopt that plan and i'll turn it back over to betsy for her technical introduction great thanks a lot willie um and just really really good to see everybody i'm seeing some faces i haven't seen for decades and it's just just wonderful um, yeah, so I'm just going to do a little Zoom orientation. I imagine all of you are very versed in Zoom, but not necessarily. So just a real quickie. Um, I've muted everybody. If you want to unmute when it's your time to speak, um, you click the little microphone at the bottom of your page that's got a red line through it, and you can unmute that way. Um, uh, let's see, oh, how to raise your hand, and we're going to do this in just a minute. There's an electronic way to raise your hand, which is you go down to the bottom of your page. There's a whole row of options like share screen, pause, chat. There's this thing called participants that has two heads on it. And if you click on participants, all the names of the people will show up, including yours. And at the bottom of that column is a little blue button that says raise hand, and you click on it, and then the, your hand is raised, and then the host can see that. So that's how you raise your hand. Um, I'm, I was planning to record this, and I thought it would be a wonderful memento for any of us, but also there are people I know want to be here and can't. So if, if you have an objection to that, if that is not comfortable for you, you can turn your camera off by at the bottom of the page right next to the microphone that you turn on and off is a video camera, and you can click on it and it will stop your video. So, and if you need to, um, I see D has a question maybe, D, is that true? Why don't you unmute by clicking your little... Yeah, um, I'm on an iPad. I think we were talking about oh, yeah. the bottom of the screen. It depends on yeah. what kind of platform you're on. Yeah. And so when I touched the participants, I saw people's names, but nothing. Just invite. I didn't yeah. say anything about hand raising. Okay. Uh, at the bottom, do you see a little button that says more? Uh, at the bottom the of your more, participants? It's, yeah, it's on the top, but there's the more. That's... Oh, yeah. raise hand is in there. Yeah. Okay. Great. 
Good. Not part I of the forgot about okay, I'm thanks. sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dee. I'm sure that was helpful to someone else besides you. Um, anyway, so again, if you don't want to be recorded, just turn your camera off. Um, and we, we decided not to have a chat room. It just felt kind of like, let's all just be together in one room together and not have the little chat thingy going back and forth. I, I hope that's all right. We don't mean to be controlling. We're just trying to, I don't know, just make this special in, in, in as much as we can. Um, now, what, what I'd like to do before we move on is if you know already that you would like to share a song, share a remembrance about George, and, and you don't have to know, but if you know you do or you're pretty sure, would you mind just electronically raising your hand right now? So again, open up participants, go to the bottom or whatever, wherever you go, click on raise hand. We want to get a little bit of a count so we can tell you how many minutes about we think share should be. So just don't be shy. I expect a lot more than that. Come on. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, good. And you can change your mind later. This is just a beginning kind of sense of sorting ourselves out a little bit. Good. Okay, so Willie, I think your suggestion of three to four minutes is probably good. And I think that more people will probably jump on later, you know. So, yeah, I think we'll just go with that. Great. You can leave your hands up if you want. Um, and then, uh, oh, I think that's it. Okay, I think we've got it. Any questions before we go on? Thanks for your patience with the technicalities. So, Ken, let's, let's hear from you. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks to Willie and Betsy for organizing this. Um, I, I first met George uh, in the 1970s, so more than 40 years ago. Um, and I live in Washington, D.C., so I knew George through his Bright Morning Star years, and then when he moved to D.C., I had the uh, good fortune to watch him lead music, be a music director at different theaters. Um, and um, a few years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, he started to have symptoms of Parkinson's, and uh, eventually it got to the point where he, he was, it was not reliable. He didn't feel like he was a reliable keyboard player, so he stopped performing, but he kept being a music director, and he would actually hire another keyboard player to come to the performances and play the uh, play the piano, but George was the music director. And then uh, about a year and a half ago or two years ago, uh, the decision was made to try this uh, cranial implant where they would put electronic devices into the brain and then they could um, stimulate the production of dopamine. And so George underwent operations to uh, to implant the devices in his head, and it, the, the there was brain damage and, and uh, infection that resulted. It was not a successful uh, it was not a successful operation, and eventually they operated and took all the took all the devices out, and never actually used them because it never got to the point where it could be therapeutic. It was uh, it was not helpful. And in fact, it did damage. And um, a little less than a year ago, George moved to an assisted living facility in Washington, and uh, several of us visited him there. But it was clear that he was losing memory. He was um, forgetting about things, couldn't remember where he left his phone, couldn't remember various things. And uh, sometime in the springtime, he actually contracted the COVID-19, which, as we all know, does more damage to the body, including brain, brain damage and other organs of the body. And I think it just it, it debilitated his whole body to the point that um, by early June, he was almost unresponsive. and. Um, the last uh, week or so of his life, he was in hospice care. And um, uh, I visited him a couple of times and didn't really, he didn't really say anything to me 
didn't open his eyes, but I think he might have known that I was there. And I think other people visited him. And uh, he died peacefully in, in the hospice situation. So I just wanted to sort of give that chronology and uh, for those who didn't realize that he was going through some serious health issues and then eventually died, I think, from the COVID-19. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Ken. I, I noticed that Otis is with us. Do you do you want to add anything to that, Otis? Um, I'm comfortable just uh, listening. I don't know that I need to add anything. Um, I mean, I might go back and say the Parkinson's was first apparent about um, 12 years ago, so so more than a couple, and that the surgery was three years ago in 2017. Um, and that, yes, he was indeed aware of folks. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, when I would come into the room, he would, um, his breathing would intensify and, and I would, you know, so the, he was always, he was um, aware of presence and, and even to the end was, um, I think, trying to communicate. There was a um, uh, sort of movement behind the eyes and things of that nature, right? So that, you know, it, it was clear he's, you know, just trying to communicate and be present. And so, so indeed, you know, when Ken says he, he thinks that he, he heard him, he, he, he did. He was very much um, present uh, up through the end. Um, I don't know that I have anything more to say. <laughs> Thanks, Otis. Well, I'm going to give my brief remembrance at this point. Um, you know, George and I were friends for about 43 years. We first met, uh, came together when we started working on the album that became Walls to Roses, Songs of Changing Men. And we actually met, it sounds more fun than it was, through a classified ad in gay community news. Um, it's actually an ad that I put out to try to make contact with other men who were making music that supported pro-feminist concerns as well as pro-LGBT concerns. And uh, we became fast friends. And even though uh, the last 35 or so years of our friendship, George was living in Washington, DC, and I would see him maybe once a year at most, um, he remained someone who I considered, you know, one of my closest friends. And my last visit with him was in December of 2019. Um, so it's hard to, um, how, do you, how do you talk about a 43 year old friendship? How do, you, how do you summarize it? You really can't, there's just so much there. But I did think of three short little vignettes that for me capture little bits of who George was. Um, one was, I remember in the days when we both lived in Cambridge and spent a lot of time together and played a lot of music together. For some reason or another, we also got into little tips every once in a while. And I have no idea even at this point what they were about. But what I do remember is being in George's apartment where he had his grand piano, his Steinway grand piano. And George and I having one of our tips, this happened more than once. And George finally just looking at me and saying, pick a number. And I would say 125. And he would open up a big book of classical compositions to page 125 and play it. And I would melt and the tiff was no more. He, he, was, he expressed so much through his music. He was such a, a beautiful player and it, it, it cut through a lot of other stuff that was going on. And the second little vignette is, you know, George as a gay man, being f close friends with a straight man was always insistent on being who he was 
and he was insistent on me knowing who he was and a little bit of what his life experience was. And at one point we were walking through the streets of Cambridge in the evening and he took my hand and he said, we're gonna walk through the streets holding hands and you can feel what it feels like to me all the time. And sure enough, a group of teenage boys passed by and they didn't attack us. They, they jeered, they, they taunted, but they didn't physically attack us. But it was, it, it was a lesson for me in what many people experience all the time. And it was a lesson for me in appreciating George's insistence that he was always who he was and he was not gonna compromise on that. He was always gonna walk down the street holding hands. And the third little vignette was during my second to last visit with George in Washington, DC. And it was right after the last surgery he had to remove the implants that Ken talked about before. And I showed up on the day that he was being moved from the hospital where the surgery took place to a, a um, a recovery hospital, I'm basing out on the word for it. You all know what I'm talking about. Rehab. And uh, spent the next couple of days with George in the rehab. And in that visit, George would kind of come in and out of being the old George as I knew him. At times he was spacey and there were a lot of things he forgot. There were things, a lot of things he needed help doing. Other times it was just like old times and we'd be laughing and joking and all, all the old reference points were there. And at one point George and I were laughing and then he just looked up and he said, here's another story for us. The time we were in the old folks home together. And he, it's a great remembrance. And, the time we were in the old folks together. So I'll leave it at that. I, I can't sum up my friendship with George for 43 years in a few minutes. None of us can, um, but I love George and I miss him. And um, I'm grateful for that friendship. Thanks, Willie. <sighs> Okay, so um, I'm not going to say a lot about George. I think there are people here who actually were much closer to him than I, but George is part of a whole era in my life, and about a third to a half of the people on this call are from that same time. So when I think of George, I think of a whole time in my life, and I think of lots of people. I almost don't think of him so much individually, but just all of us, this sort of organism of young, wild, hippie, ambisexual emerging young adults in Cambridge, you know, and it was just a magical time, you know, it was just a magical time. And George was a real part of that. And, and what I think of when I think of George is that he was sort of breathtakingly honest, super authentic. I mean, I always knew where he was, you know, and I felt really safe with him because of that, you know, that in my life, he wasn't devious, he wasn't hidden. Now, those of you who know him better, and Otis, I just want to say how glad I am you're here, by the way. It's nice to see you um, personally. I'm David Stark's partner, in case you don't know who I am. And, um, and so those who know him better probably know a lot more complicated, but I got the George of kind of that zest, that life energy, you know, and, and that just um, kind of when in doubt, do it kind of <laughs> spirit. And the one vignette that comes to mind is kind of a funny one. We, he and I, and maybe Marsha, could have been Marsha, a couple of other people, we piled into a car one day to go up to the North Shore where there was this inn that had a hot tub. And, and this was when hot tubs were just becoming a thing in my, in my world anyway. And you could, without having to register at the inn, you could pay some money and go to the hot tub or the sauna, whatever it was. And we thought this would be very cool. So. Oh, and my partner, David, who's still my partner, unbelievably enough, um, we're all doing that. And David got into some kind of a snit about something which he was wont to do. And it just undid me. It just totally undid me because we were a pretty new relationship and I didn't know how to handle it. George was completely unfazed by this ridiculous behavior. 
And and at one point we were walking toward the, the sauna or the steam, whatever, and David was doing his thing and I was just about in tears. And, and George just said this kind of light flippant thing like, well, he's just feeling what he needs to feel, you know, like no big deal, ran right off his back. And I thought, oh my God, if I could ever be like that, <laughs> I want to channel that, you know. Oh, bless you, George. I just, just love you so much. So I'm going to offer a little song and then we'll open it up to all of you. I wrote this many years ago, but it's, um, it's a song I tend to sing at times like this. finally your turn and I'm going to start with John Paul he's at the top of my list hi John Paul you want to unmute hi Betsy hey everybody a lot of people here who <laughs> names I see who I probably haven't seen in 35 years um, you know sometimes someone people come into your lives at these moments in time and they're very special and very touching and then you don't see them again for years and I have this you know I love to have this collection of friends in my pocket who, you know, when you reach out to them again, it's like you've never left. And George was that way. Um, I met George um, 
in the late 70s, early 80s, um, through the men's movement, feminist men's movement. And um, we dated. We were very, we were close across the continent. I was in Berkeley, he was in Cambridge, but uh, it was a great connection. Uh, and I always held him in my heart uh, uh, from that time on and saw him a few times over the years, but not that much. But I have a, I have a favorite story of George's, with George because he had this great way, like you said, Betsy, of just diving in and turning situations upside down from where they were at. And um, we were at the National Conference on Men and Masculinity in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think, I'm not, I mean, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, uh, Willie and myself and George and Fred Small were all in the shower. We were in the same shower room at some college dorm taking showers together. And George said, you know what? we really need to explore ourselves as men. We need to wash each other and just put soap over each other and clean each other up. And so George and I started doing that. And then Willie said, I'm in. And so we're washing Willie. And Fred goes, no way. <laughs> he said, you're not touching me. And um, George had this great way of just doing that, you know, creating little dramatic fun episodes in life and, and uh, um, we're, we're all lesser because he has you know left us at this point so early on in one's life um, I'm honored to have been close with him and um, loved him and known him and um, yeah that's what I have to say Thanks, John. Um, Marsha, Marsha Taylor, one of the original Bright Morning Stars. Muting. Let's see. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, you're perfect. Good, 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 good. Well, my friend Willie said um, he could not sum up 43 odd years of friendship um, in a few sentences. And oddly enough, I feel that I can. Um, and, uh, but first, I'll tell you a very short anecdote. One day, um, I was walking behind him into a house, and it was a snowy, cold, bitter cold uh, time. And I noticed that George was wearing a groovy, I'm trying to lower my hand. Let's see, lower hand. There we go. Uh, a, a really cool, bright blue down parka. And I said, George, that is a great, great coat. And he said, oh, thank you. I made it. And I said, what? He said, yes, I made it. And I said, how'd you do that? And he said, well, you know, I went on, I, I got a, a, a kit. I got a pattern and I made it. And I was flabbergasted. And I said, that is amazing. I really admire you. And he turned around just as we were getting to the house and he said, does admire that mean that you think you can't do it? And I was totally taken aback. And that is what I admire you meant. Hmm. It, to me, when I said that, it meant, wow, I could never do that. You know? And so he picked right up on the subtext and honest George, right? He just like went for it. And I have never forgotten that moment. Um, you know, and when we think about the great peacemakers, um, the justice makers, we admire them, don't we? And I, I ask myself and I ask all of us, does that mean we think we can't do that? Um, so I, I just always remember that about George. And when I think about summing up my relationship with him, it's pretty simple. I was in love with him. And I would contend that most of us were. He was such a bright, bright being. And um, to my credit and to George's credit, me loving him that way never got in the way of our friendship. <laughs> so I still love him. I'm in love with him. And, you know, I never had to act on that. Um, so the day he died, I wrote him a song. 
the love song that is in my heart for George, and I'm going to share it with you now. I knew you when the world was filled with hope and possibility. I knew you when we were young and in our prime. When our lives spread out before us like a diamond studded shawl. A universe to voyage through together. I knew you when we were not quite formed yet. I knew you when we explored our edges, wondering if we were doing it right or not, or not, or not. And now you're gone, and the world's still filled with hope and possibility. spread out before us like a diamond studded shawl a universe to voyage through a little poorer now without you I knew you when I knew you when Lovely Marcia, thank you. Um D, would you like to go now? Thank you, Doc. Um Oh boy, I didn't really prepare something, but I've been thinking about George a lot. Am I centered for the, I'm, I'm on this weird iPad. Is, am I centered in what you see? Um, I've been thinking about George a lot in the last several weeks and wrote up a reminiscence of him with pictures um, that I can send to people if they want. And I also have a second info sheet that really has helped with a little bit of his performances, uh, recordings, and links to things on the web. I'll figure out the best way if people are interested in, in getting that. Um, I met George also 43 years ago in 1977 in the summer. Um, I think that he, George found out about GCN for me. I'm not 100% sure of that. But, um, so that means I can take credit for, <laughs> for meeting Willie. What happened was George was a, uh, a cashier at the Cambridge Food Co-op. And I thought he was very cute and um, was always looking for somebody to start a conversation. And then the GCN, Gay Community News, was a weekly uh, progressive paper in Boston. And the issue after the Pride Parade in Boston had a picture of George in the middle, smack in the middle of the picture. And so I took, took the cover, um, this was the cover shot of the paper that week. And I took it to George to show him at the co-op and he was flabbergasted. He, but it was very cool that he was on the paper. I'm pretty sure he said he didn't know what GCN was. Um, and so that's how we, we became friends. We exchanged phone numbers and went over and had heavy talks at his house. Um, and I think the thing about that he was, the thing that was so amazing to me was that he was this combination of talent and focus and also spaciness. I, mean, I remember him being very spacey way back then for getting things 
um, forgetting dates, forgetting uh, things that we had done in common not that long ago. And we would talk about it because as everyone said, he was so direct. And we would talk about how I considered him spacey and um, he said he would sort of work on it and didn't really see it my way. But um, I loved that he could just be totally in the moment and talk about what he was feeling. He was one of those people who always talked sort of in the present participle, he would say, I am feeling this. Um, and I think some of that must have come from his co-counseling background. And I'm curious if anyone else here knew him through co-counseling. Um, I guess the other thing about that milieu in, in Cambridge and Somerville in the late 70s and early 80s, a lot of us are now boomers um, who were in their 20s or maybe early 30s in that period. And it was totally magical for me, just the values and meeting share, people with shared values. And one um, emblem of that was this feminist soccer game that we used to play uh, up on the fields near Tufts at um, Powderhouse Square. And I think Kathy Hoffman, who was here, was one of the people who started that. She was in a group house in somewhere with Eric Rofus, if it's the same Kathy Hoffman I'm thinking of. And with the idea behind feminist soccer, and I think George was there, but I'm not 100% sure, but it's sort of, for Betsy, it was sort of emblematic of this spirit of men and women, pro-feminist men, gay and straight. And we didn't keep score and we were all very silly, but we got a huge workout running around on the field. Um, so thank you, Kathy, if that was part of your thing. Um, I have lots of George anecdotes, but I think I'll just, if anyone is interested, they can figure out a way to reach me, maybe through Willie, and I can send them either the reminiscence that I wrote with a lot of pictures and the info sheet, which I haven't sent out to anyone yet. Thanks a lot to Willie for, and others for organizing this and everyone for being, being here. Thank you, Dee. Jean, would you like to? Sure, be happy to. Wow, what a blast from the past. And when Betsy, when you said, do we have any questions? I'm like, how do we all get so old? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I first met George when I was living in DC and uh, everybody, I had gone to uh, New York to study guitar in 1979. When I came back to DC, uh, Bright Morning Star was staying at the group house next door. And that's when I first met George. But I, I just always remember him at the People's Music Network gatherings and just, again, what a bright spirit and just joy, just beautiful, pure spirit of joy. And I was glad when he moved to D.C. And when I turned 40 in 1980, um, I decided to do a show where I was going to do folk music, classical music, and Broadway. And my uh, voice teacher at the time was working with, jo uh, with George as his accompaniment. So that all just dovetailed beautifully. So George, I got the pleasure of having George back me up on my show. And uh, oh, just a, a wonderful musician. Just eff It seemed effortless. I'm sure it wasn't, but it just seemed effortless. And um, I just feel like he was a bright spirit and he had more of a sh more than a share of misfortune and bad luck and just his beautiful heart shone through all of it. And uh, yeah, I'm just grateful. That, that's all I have. Thank you. Betsy, do we want to do the song now or do one more? You're, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. No. Yeah, I think this is a great time to do it. Um, we're going to just take a musical break and bring George sort of virtually in. Um, and we'll see what happens. This is a little new to me, so give, we'll cross our fingers. Oh, that's not it. frustrated it's yeah click, down, click here click where da down below it says welcome home there it is no but we don't want welcome home we oh, want his friend yeah oh, you're, right. you're right i had press's friend before folks i'm sorry why don't we do another share and i'll fuss with this okay so 
Rob Dobson. Rob, do you want to give your... There we go. Sorry, it took me a minute. Oh, it's so great to hear all these stories about George. It just reminds me of all the... Song is by Pete Seeger. It just reminds me of so many facets of what a, what a sparkly soul he was. Willie, thank you for organizing, and, and Betsy. And Otis, I'm so glad to see you here. Uh, I met George in 1981, I think, when I came to Boston, and, um, and I ended up being his housemate for a very short time, for about three and a half months in 1982, the winter of 1982 in Somerville. And he was on tour for part of that, I think with Bright Morning Star, and um, so it was like even less than three and a half months. But it was a very potent three and a half months. I mean, can you imagine living with George Fulgeniti? <laughs> it was a joy. And, um, you know, they say that a, one of the signs of a great being is that they're very good cooks. And George was a very good cook. And um, he cooked out of, it, it, the way he cooked was very much, very much reflected his personality. It was very playful and very irreverent. You know, he would, he would look at recipes, but then toss them aside and work with what he had and say, well, let's try this. Let's, that's an idea, but let, let's do this. And, you know, it was very in, improvisational. And um, I really related to that. And, and we had a great time cooking for each other. And um, in all the times I would see him or, or talk to him on the phone in later years, we, we would always mention about the cooking and what, what fun that was. Um, I, I had an uh, opportunity to come to Washington several, quite, quite a few times. Uh, I'm an artist and I was doing the Smithsonian craft show. Um, and I would often see George uh, during that time. I'd call him up and we'd have brunch or something. And, and um, I remember, I think the last time I saw him, he came to the show and saw my work. And um, as he was leaving, he gave me this big sexy kiss right in the middle of the show. I mean, that was just so George, uh, uninhibited. And, uh, and as, as you said, just always being himself. So um, it, was, it was a short time that I knew him, but he had a big influence on me. Willie, shall I give it another try? I can't hear you, Willie, you're muted. Let's give it another try. Matt Hoffman says yes, that's good enough for me. Okay, I think I got it this time. You have to unmute, Betsy. We can't hear it.
that that's just so George. It's just so George. Such a perfect vehicle for him. His, his joy just comes through so clearly. Um, I don't see any more hands raised. Is there anyone else who would like to say something? Rick Golden. Hello. Um, two things. I I met. George through the People's Music Network. And he was living in a house in Alston, I think it was Sparhawk Street. And he was building a studio in the basement and he put the word out that he was looking for people to help him with the plastering or the, the sheetrock or something. So I volunteered, I didn't really know him and I worked a couple of days there and that was when I first got to know him. Um, and the other thing is I have a really vivid memory of a People's Music Network gathering probably in 85, somewhere in there. He organized a chorus of, I don't know, 30 or 40 people that were there and, and um, rehearsed with them to do the song by Michael Jackson, uh, Man in the Mirror. So some of you, if you were at that gathering, you might remember, but I have this vivid memory of him conducting this group and I had never heard that song before and now and it was really good and he was like stopping the group and trying to get them to do it really well and um, now whenever I hear that song on the radio I think of him immediately and it's been like that ever since like there's a song that just connects with a memory like that so um, Maybe some of you, if you do remember him conducting that chorus now, next time you hear Man in the Mirror, um, uh, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make the change. Da, 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 da. Anyway, um, that's my George memory. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Gary Lepo, my brother Gary. I don't have many stories, but every time I was with George, it was always at some event, uh, the Vancouver Folk Festival or a bunch of men's gatherings. And the story I just want to tell is being in a car, I think this was the Amherst men's gathering with John Paul and Willie and George and me. And I think George was driving and it was rainy and the windows of the car were completely fogged up by our breath. And George started us all on the way to this men's gathering, singing men, 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 men. And it was just like insane because we could hardly see out the windows and we were just ecstatic. So that's my memory of George I want to share. Thanks, Gary. Anybody else? Cheryl. You're, you're still muted, Cheryl. Hang on, here we go. Um, so uh, traveling on the road with George and Bright Morning Star, as you can imagine, was uh, a marvelous adventure. Um, and we learned early on uh, that we had to institute what we called the weather report. Um, so every time we were going to have a meeting, we sat down and we started with, I believe George initiated this, uh, we would check in about how we were doing, how we were feeling. And um, it was important uh, actually for George to, to lead off uh, frequently because George had a way of checking in about his feelings that took us all to a deeper level. And after George spoke, we were all opened in a way that allowed us to say what was really going on. He gave us that permission with his feelings. And I think um, that's something uh, I just believe is true about George, that he was able to open up a lot of people to feel their feelings um, and experience the, the joy and the suffering 
that he was feeling and we all feel. Uh, I'm Ben Towsley. I'm, I'm uh, here too. <laughs> and uh, I want to say hello to everybody and a lot of old friends. Um, three words come to mind uh, when I think of George and they're from William Blake. Uh, and that it's exuberance is beauty. Mm. He was a beautifully exuberant person. Mm -hmm. Indeed. John? We'll, we'll, Anne, we'll have, we'll have John and then you, if that's okay. Okay. I. Uh, knew George only briefly in um, the mid 80s. Um, I, uh, we went together in a um, brigade to Nicaragua and um, we were supposed to be picking cotton, but the uh, Nicaraguan authorities realized that gringos didn't know diddly about picking coffee. And uh, so we were, uh, we got there, we found out instead of going up to the mountains where we had part packed you know, clothes like uh, sweaters and the uh, cool nights, we were on, they decided to have us pick cotton where we could do, I guess, easier, easier job, do less potential damage you know, to the, than what we could do to the, you know, the coffee bushes. And, um, so we were on the sweltering coastal plain instead in the province of Chinandega. And uh, we were, uh, you know, a barracks of about uh, maybe 20 of us together um, for almost two weeks, I think. And um, George was a member of that brigade and I just, uh, with us and I, I can always remember his infectious enthusiasm and uh, how much he just made me smile. Thanks, John. Anne? We can't hear you, Anne. You don't seem to be muted, but maybe your volume's not up. Yeah, I haven't seen a microphone on Anne's window the whole time, so I'm not sure you have audio, Anne. All right. Maybe she could write what she wanted to say in the chat. You could, yeah, Anne, you could do that. The chat is at the bottom of your screen. You just click on it. You can just select everyone from the choice of who to communicate with. And yeah, put your remembrance in. That would be wonderful. Um, let's say the chat is disabled. Is it? Seriously? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, phooey. Um, just maybe I can change that. Hold on. Okay. I just fixed it, I think. Yes. Okay. It's good now. So, Anne, we, we still can't hear you, but if you want to type in something into the chat feature at the bottom, then we'll all see it. But we can't hear you. Did I see Steve Jones raising a hand? Uh, I don't, did, I'm not sure. I know that Eric Kilburn did, did oh. raise his. Yeah, so, Steve, Steve Jones raised his hand too. Okay. Well, uh, go ahead, Steve, and then and then Eric. Well, it's good to see some faces I haven't seen in a long time. It's it's um. Uh, I thought I'd share just a little bit of uh, I, I guess I first met George probably seventy eight seventy nine, but especially here in D.C. Um, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about his just wonderful. Uh, work in the musical theater field. He might be the most celebrated musical theater director in Washington, D.C., having won Helen Hayes Awards. And uh, when he came to town, he called me up because I was tuning pianos, and I, I tuned his piano the last 35 years. 
Uh, but he would always introduce me to people at Arena Stage and kind of got me going a little bit in, in musical theater. And I'd go to see him give performances and, and uh, some of his big successes with, that he won awards for would be uh, Cabaret, South Pacific, he did Camelot, Animal Crackers. He, he did these big, big, Oklahoma was a big show that, uh, you know, that they would go on the road after, after Georgia directed them in DC. One of the funniest memories I have is he did a duet at the Folger Shakespeare Library and uh, he didn't always call me or let me know that there was going to be a, a good get a good event coming up. He just, but I think this time he did say, I'm going to do this very fun backing up of a well-known actor and singer, Floyd King. And they came out on stage and did this wonderful duet. George is playing and Floyd, Floyd is acting and singing. And at some point Floyd says, I'm going to let George take the stage now. So George's playing piano, singing a little bit. And he steps up from the piano and starts dancing and the piano keeps playing. And so the whole audience falls off. <laughs> we were all going like, were you playing that piano the whole time? So I, they had some kind of recording or something going on, but there were about 300 of us watching Floyd and George just, um, they had a, a just a wonderful magnetic uh, uh, performance that, that night. So anyway, that was just a little bit of a, a flavor of George's, uh, and he had such an impact on my uh, music. He listened, we, we, we would share um, stories about what we were working on and he, he, had, he had an instinct for how musical theater flows that was really, uh, he knew his craft. I will miss him. Thanks, Steve. And by the way, if anyone is interested in getting more of a sense of George's life as a theater, musical theater director, there's a really wonderful 40 minute tribute that the DC theater community made of testimonials to George, um, person after person who talks about what an influence George was on their work and their life at both in terms of his musical theater direction and him as a human being. It's really quite lovely and it gives you a glimpse, those of us who know George from his Cambridge folky days or Bright Morning Star days, there's this whole other 35 year long piece of George that was incredibly influential, touched many, many lives in the same way he touched our lives, but in a totally different context, and, but one in which he shined. So um, maybe I can find that before we leave and put, put a link to it in the chat box if you'd like to check that video out. Um, Eric. Am I unmuted now? Is that working? Nice to see so many old friends. Um, I first met George in 1979. I was 23, and uh, I think he was the first gay man that I ever became close to. And uh, George was just, from the word, from the first time I met him, was just completely just out there, completely proud of who he was, completely fearless. Um, I remember being hugged by him like I've never been hugged by another man. It was like an ankle to, to head hug. You know, every part of your body was connected. And uh, he was just so joyful and, and unafraid in his interactions with people. It was, it was inspiring. I, uh, I made a, re a recording, an album in his studio uh, just after he'd sold it, but he uh, played piano on it and uh, sang on one of the tunes. And um, I'll always remember we, re we were rehearsing at my house before the uh, recording, I think, and we went swimming. We decided to go swimming at a local lake in Newton and uh, he didn't have any, any, any uh, trunks. So I, I found him a pair of mine and, and uh, as he was going to the bathroom to get changed, he said, you know, Eric, this isn't really big for me. I've always wanted to get into your pants. And uh, 
that's just so George for me. Like, you know, I never felt, th you know, in any way, like, like that was weird. That was just exactly what he, he, should, he should say. And, that, and uh, we had many moments like that. And uh, I'll miss him. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you, Eric. Kathy Hoffman. So I uh, just have to say two things. One, um, John already talked about the experience that I was going to share because I was part of that delegation also mm -hmm. in 1984 in Nicaragua. And um, there was a meeting at CASA in um, Cambridge for people who wanted to go to Nicaragua for these uh, brigades, work brigades. And I had thought to myself, well, I'm, I really would like to go, but I'm nervous about being like the only gay person there. So there's other gay, if there's one other gay person, I'll go and went to the meeting and 80% of us were, were gay or lesbian. <laughs> it was like hilarious. But the leadership of our group, including some people who actually were gay, but were old left, old left. And so they gave us very strict instructions uh, that there were certain conversations we were not to have in Nicaragua. And one of them was about homosexuality. And the other was about Judaism because it was a Christian country and homophobic. So we were not to discuss these things. And so when we got to those barracks that John described and quite rightly that we were supposed to pick coffee, but if you damage coffee, it's ruined. But if you damage cotton, they burn the crops anyway at the end. So <laughs> no problem. And it was really, really, really hot. And uh, it was really dusty in these barracks. And some of us were like, Whew, it is really hot. And our leadership was like, Nicaraguans are suffering. Just you don't speak that way. <laughs> so there we were. And about four days in, this youth brigade came, um, led by again a man named Marlon and these young uh, Sandinistas who were from the from a college but coming to do their work contribution so they arrive about 15 of them and the first thing they said is oh my god it's so hot and dusty here this is awful <laughs> and within two days we ended up having these conversations with them about homosexuality and about how many of us were gay on this brigade including George and um and they were so interested. And they were like, you mean gay people are supporting us? We, we didn't even know. And it was this sense that by being who we were um, in solidarity with them, that it led to transformation. And I just felt like being there with George in sharing a sort of spirit of um, complete vulnerability, but it's like we're we're, we're going to be who we are, um, and we'll be respectful. Um, it was just remarkable. And the other reason I thought I had to say something is, I played lesbian softball, but I did not play soccer. Mm -hmm. So I have to say that that wasn't me. But I would have liked it to have been me. <laughs> Most of the other times I got to see George was in the presence of all of you gorgeous people, Cheryl and Marsha, Charlie, uh, at every Bright Morning Star concert I possibly could. And also like Betsy, it's so lovely to see many of you that I have not seen for a very long time. So I really appreciate George bringing us together to uh, celebrate in the lives that we're living now in this time of remarkable possibility, as Marsha points out, remarkable possibility. And I'm sorry George isn't here to, uh, to uh, talk, tell us what he thinks of this moment. Um, Michael or Elliot or anyone else? I think Marcy has her hand up. Oh, good. Mercy. Great. Uh, first, I'm going to read what Anne Franklin put in the chat because she, we couldn't hear her. Um, the Reverend Anne Franklin. Uh, 
I may be the only one here who knows what George was doing on the eve of September 7th, 1987. He was prancing around his living room in his best red dress and high heels in celebration of my ordination. He promised he would celebrate that way since he could not be there while the other members of Bright Morning Star were singing at the service. Can't you see it? Can't you just see it? Prancing around his living room in best red dress and high heels. So um, I don't have I don't have a story. I have a lot of memories. Um, but I think all I want to say tonight is I want to express my gratitude that George Fulgenita Shikar walked and danced upon this earth and touched so many lives with his beauty, his sparkle, his light, his tremendous courage, his honesty, and all the other qualities that made him George. I just want to invite us all to take a deep breath and breathe in, George. And on the next breath, we're going to let, when we release our breath, just let him go wherever he needs to be. Thank you, George. I see David Stark is in the house. Do you want to say anything, David? George was my best gay male friend, and my favorite memory was coming home in a bad mood, and on the phone message, he said, you cheap slut. <laughs> <laughs> that was George to me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Anyone else like to say anything, or do we want to move on to a final song from Ken? I've got a question. Yep. Um, does anybody know for sure if George conducted the combined gay band concert at the 1987 March on Washington? Yes, he did. Okay. Yes, he did. I thought so, but I wasn't 100% sure. For a, a while, George conducted the the LGBTQ jazz uh, big band in Washington, D.C. And on one of my visits to D.C., I got to sit in and play with them on a rehearsal. Um, and it was through conducting that band that he got invited to conduct the combined bands at the National Gathering. Thanks. I'd like to share. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Noelle Kesselheim, and I am Michael Husson's partner. And, um, you know, uh, I met George um, through Michael in because um, they were living together on Magazine Street in um, we met in 86. And um, I have to just say, I, I think I'm echoing a lot of folks, but um, I just kind of fell in love with George on site. He was just such an incredibly endearing, um, exuberant presence. And I also felt like any man who was living with a man like George had to be a pretty good guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't have a huge number of stories. Um, I, I got connected with George and, and a little bit with Marsha and with Ursula and some of that. I, I spent time at Bright Morning Star um, concerts and then some of the later gatherings out here where we live in Western Mass. And then um, one of our kids, uh, Aiden ended up going to school in DC and we got to reconnect with George a little bit 
in that time. And he um, really generously invited us to uh, a show. He was, he was the musical director for Avenue Q. And um, I just remember being so moved by his versatility and his, um, the ease at which he, he sort of navigated all of these these arts and 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 the way he connected with people and connected all of us you know it was it was just very powerful um so i'm really i'm really grateful to george i of course wish you know i wish we'd had more more contact in a more ongoing way um I also have this memory of when when we all first met that he and Michael had a cat named Katza, and um, George had found Katza uh, abandoned at a toll booth. I don't know, New somewhere Jersey. New Jersey Turnpike or something. And um, but she was really precious, and she went. She moved when when George moved out, and and Michael and I moved in together. Katza went with George, but. He used to periodically let us know how she was doing, and I and I also just remember how he called when she died, and how heartbroken he was when she died. And um, I just think of him as being such a tender, tender, and also incredibly resilient um, spirit. So I um, I wanted to just share this phrase that. I just looked up, but that um, I guess I've come to think in recent years that you know when people die, they're not here, but but their the relationship doesn't end. You know that that the connections and the relationships we have change, but but they're not gone um, in a certain way. And um, anyway, this is a quote from Mary Oliver. Let us hope it will always be like this, each of us going on in our inexplicable ways, building the universe. And I guess I just feel like um, George brought a lot to the universe that we're all sharing. And um, I think he would love that we're all here together tonight. Thanks. Anyone else, Deborah or Elliot or Otis? All right, well, thank you all for sharing those stories, those remembrances, Marsha's song. Um, Ken, do you wanna take us out with, before we move into a chat or a... Uh, so, is this where you want to hear uh, going down the valley? I, th I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a recording. Could I just by... say a quick thing, Ken? I'm sorry. Yeah. I just want to say that, that this was by by personal request, um, and this song is is so gorgeous, as you all know. But when George was not doing well in the last month, and and we knew from Willie that he was failing, and I think Ken as well. And we tried to find a recording of this song to play for him over the phone. We wanted to call him at the care home that he was in and play this over the phone to him. And we recorded it off our scratchy LP. And then we tried to get him on the phone. And it was all just a little bit too late, you know. But it just stayed with me that this is the song I wanted to sing to him at the end. So that's why I asked for it. I just wanted to say that. Thanks. So let's see, I have to share this.
So how are people feeling? How many of you would like to um, stay and talk more in breakout rooms? Or see one hand. Couple, couple of hands. Couple. Sure. Why don't you just stay on? We'll say goodbye. We'll sort of close. And then if you want to stay and chat, we'll, we'll make that happen. How about that? Sounds good. Well, I just want to say I really appreciate everybody joining us and sharing your stories and remembering George together. It feels, um, I don't know if there's ever closure on someone you love dying, but um, maybe there's comfort at least in a collective saying goodbye um so thank thank you to all of you yeah, yeah, thank you so much. yeah i'll just say goodbye and thanks um for willie for having the inspiration and ken and, and contributing what you contributed and 
how blessed we are to have been brought together by our, our favorite guy. So um, carry him on in our hearts. I know we will. Mm -hmm.